All right, everyone. Um, it is one o'clock, so I guess we will go ahead and get started. Um, I just want to welcome you and thank you uh, for joining our session on utilizing innovative learning for career prep. Uh, my name is Michelle Haynes, and I work with the Instructional Design and Technology team at the University of Oklahoma in the College of uh, Professional and Continuing Studies. So my colleagues and I are excited to be here today. We're going to share with you a couple of innovative learning strategies that we have uh, implemented in our courses to help students be prepared uh, with specific job and career skills. Um, it's probably important for me to note that we are a fully online college, so all of our courses are fully online. Um, so these activities that we'll be sharing with you today are created with the online space in mind. However, they, they're easily translated um, into the face-to-face -face, uh, environment as well. So a little bit about what we'll be covering today. Uh, we are gonna share with you two examples of scenario-based and applied learning strategies that we've created uh, in, across two of our programs. One is our organizational leadership program and the other is our criminal justice program. So we've integrated these activities to try to uh, pinpoint specific job-related skills that students will need to be able to know uh, and complete uh, for the careers that they're moving into. So we're gonna share those two examples with you uh, and also give you just a little bit about the theory behind those examples and why we selected them. Um, so also we hope uh, that by the end of this session, you'll be able to think of a few uh, job related skills that you would like for your students to have at the end of their courses or programs that maybe you're looking for a way to implement and uh, possibly a couple of these ideas uh, will jog some ideas for you. So before we get too far into this, I would like to hear from you, um, what are some of the skills and competencies that you would like for your students to have when they either complete your courses, your programs, or your degrees? So there's a QR code here, scan it with your phone, it'll take you to a Padlet. Um, also, we've posted the link uh, to the Padlet in the chat. So if you'll just go to that and give me some of your thoughts on what you want students to be able to do when they graduate from a course, from a degree or just transferable skills. So grant writing, yeah, that is that is a fantastic example. Micro certifications for the industry, yeah. We're certainly moving towards micro credentialing in many fields and with many programs. And as you're thinking through this, I would say, you know, hopefully these are some ideas that you have, but maybe some that the others are sharing in this group or some that would relate to your programs as well. Job skills, for sure. Certification, test prep, get them ready so they can get those certs and get the jobs. Absolutely. Operation, yeah, running facilities, operations, organizational leadership, organizational uh, planning, absolutely. Lesson plans, perfect example, yeah. So as you continue to populate this Padlet, um, I'll leave it up and you can review it. Um, but let's just keep these in mind as we work through these and maybe again, it'll jog some ideas for you uh, and how you could uh, make these transferable skills appropriate for your students within your curriculum. Critical thinking and analysis, right? That is the gold standard if we could just graduate students with strong critical thinking skills. Um, it's something that's identified uh, in the job field as well. That is something that we need our students to have. Excellent. All right. So uh, the, first, the first example of a learning activity we would like to share with you is a scenario-based learning activity that we use in our criminal justice program. So what is uh, scenario-based learning? That's a great question. I would love to tell you. Um, it is based on situated learning theory, uh, which basically is looking at the interplay between a situation and the learning event. So we're situating it within a real world, uh, sometimes simulated scenario in order to give students the skills that they need. So our scenario-based learning is based on a real world scenario. We're having them apply. So we're first giving them those skills, having them apply those skills. Um, and then importantly, it's adaptive to student needs. So we want the instructor or the facilitator to be involved in the scenario-based learning to the point that they can lead and direct the scenario according to what the students are doing well, what they've mastered, where they may need a little bit more support. So it's very interactive, student to instructor, student to student, and student to content. Now in PACS, we like to frame our scenario-based and skills-based learning around three core principles. Uh, one is that they are authentic, 
we always use real world context as much as possible. Um, and we want to simulate what it would actually be like in the field or in the profession so that they have practiced these skills before they get into the field and the profession applied. Uh, we want to take these real world scenarios and have students apply the skills, theories, and models that they're learning in the course and the program to these scenarios. And then finally, it's active, which is hugely important. Um, and that doesn't mean that students are physically up and moving around. It means that they're actively engaging with the content. So we try to create scenarios where students are actively engaging with the content, with the information, with one another, uh, with the context, and with their instructor. And the hope of all of that active learning and active interaction is they can either create or co-create new knowledge uh, throughout this activity. So given that kind of background on scenario-based learning, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Kara Stanley, who's going to share more about how we applied this to the criminal justice context. So the course we chose within criminal justice was Homeland Security and Evolving Threats. And what we're doing in here, um, we're putting into place a course spanning applied exercise. It uh, spans the entire length of the course and involves several smaller uh, assignments that lead up to an entire class simulation in which they are responding to a Homeland Security crisis. This course spanning applied exercise allows us to evaluate six of our nine course outcomes in this course. They analyze the roles of federal, state, and local agencies in responding to threats against the U.S. homeland. They synthesize the strengths and weaknesses of the organizational structure of these uh, agencies. They engage in intellectual dialogue on current and evolving Homeland Security threats. They evaluate the Homeland Security response in a select case study, and they apply course knowledge by participating in the simulated Homeland Security crisis. And then at the very end of the course, they evaluate the simulation security crisis response through a discussion and what we call an after action report or a debrief. So the first thing we have them doing in this is we have them acquiring some micro-credential certifications. These are acquired through the FEMA Emergency Management Institute. And it has a direct application in law enforcement because all local, state, tribal, and territorial jurisdictions are required to adopt the NIMS or the National Incident Management System in order to receive federal preparedness grants. In Oklahoma, any first responder and all dispatchers are required to have three basic NIMS training courses. We are offering two of them in this course for anyone who doesn't already have them. They have to go out and take them. The higher you get in the hierarchy as a first responder or a dispatcher, the more training you're going to have to have. But this course will actually give them two of the first ones. We're asking them to take IS-700B, which is Introduction to NIMS. We're asking them to take IS-100C, which is the Introduction to the Incident Command System. And we're asking them to take IS-120C, Introduction to Exercises. That's the only one that they would not directly need as a first responder. And we're asking them to take it so that they have a basis when they get to the simulation on how that's supposed to run, what they're expected to do, and what an after action report is. So in this, as I mentioned, we're having them do several smaller assignments. So leading up to the main simulation. Simulations, whether they're tabletop or live simulated, exercises are frequently used in law enforcement and emergency management to validate capabilities and identify areas that require improvement. So what you do is you get all of your stakeholders together in a room, police, fire, uh, state responders. Uh, we've had people from hospitals, uh, school districts, everybody that would have a response in an emergency into the room. You present them the scenario and you let them respond to the scenario. Then you look at how they responded and identify, did they do well? Do we have areas we need to improve? Do we have areas we need resources? And we kind of just go from there. So that's something that they will actively do in their career. So we have them taking the three preparatory micro-credentials. We have them doing a single agency exercise, which is one agency, in this case, it was a city, responding to an emergency and they have to come up with a response plan. That's their written exercise. 
then they have to give a briefing on the response plan to say an emergency management board or other group of people. Then once they've done all of that, we get to the group simulation scenario in week seven, where they have to respond across the week to a simulation in progress. And we had two options for this. One being a cyber attack on a uh, utility system and the other being a bombing scenario. As you can see in the picture here, we have some pretty intense information for the instructor. When you're doing this, you must structure out the instructor side as well as the student side so that any instructor that has it knows exactly what they need to do and when they need to do it and how to grade it. So they have information to provide throughout the week. Students respond in their group discussions and in their main discussion. And then the next week they give an after action report uh, as an audio or video presentation. And this is to break down what did we do well, what do we need to improve, so that they kind of know their response. So coming out of this, we want them to have that FEMA certification training. That is an applied thing. They can put it on their resume. They can line that out and it looks good. And it's something that they actually need. They will also come out of this class with a familiarity with tabletop exercises that we use in emergency response planning. And that's a, a skill that they can directly apply. They also should have the ability to conceptualize emergency scenarios and formulate an appropriate response during the flow of a simulation and the ability to create an after action report and provide a response plan briefing. This is something they might have to do. They might be the person creating the response plan and having to give that to other people. Okay, thank you, Kara, uh, for that introduction and that application of scenario-based learning. So now we're gonna show off the other uh, example, which is a skills-based learning exercise for career preparation. This is through an e-portfolio. And in the College of Professional and Continuing Studies, uh, we use the e-portfolio in the Bachelor of Arts and Organizational Leadership Program. So as part of developing this e-portfolio, students will demonstrate the skills and the competencies that they have gained as they have progressed through the program. And the C portfolio is a culminating project in which the students show off what they have learned and how they have grown as organizational leaders. As part of this, I'm going to help you define an e portfolio. So first, it's a demonstration of learning progression and achievement. So students acquire many skills as they progress through our BAOL program. This e-portfolio allows them to collect and highlight those skills in one place. Whatever skills are highlighted though, whenever you're making an e-portfolio, it is very important to be intentional about the material that goes into it. In this particular case, we have students collect essays, projects, graphics, videos, any other sort of artifact that they feel is useful for showcasing them and showcasing their skill. Also, the e-portfolio can be used to facilitate reflection. Here in PAX, we are on our way to emphasizing throughout all of our courses, metacognition. We want students to reflect on their growth in the course and throughout their entire program. And so the ePortfolio was one very helpful way for students to do that. And of course, as I've said earlier, uh, students will showcase their skills uh, to potential employers. And that is another reason why the ePortfolio was developed. It's not just to have students that create a culminating project for their capstone. It's to give them something that they can take with them after they graduate so that they can show to potential employers like what they have accomplished as they have learned to be organizational leaders, how they have built their personal brands, what they can bring to the company that should hire them. Finally, I'm going to go into a few of the theoretical foundations that underpin ePortfolios, like why we in PACS have chosen to use ePortfolios as part of our capstone in the BAOL program. So first, as you see, students document and generate new content based on what they've learned. So they collect the content that they've developed over months, over years, over all the different courses that they've taken for the BAOL. 
and then they reflect on it. They build like websites or however else they wish to build the e-portfolio. And also when they do this, it gives them agency. That's the, another important thing too, to increase motivation. We want students to take ownership of what they do and what they have learned. And the e-portfolio is a great way to do that. We want them to reflect on their growth and we want them to develop their own identities as organizational leaders. In addition, students adopt future-oriented thinking. It's not just about the grade. It's not just about completing the capstone. It's not just about you know, completing this one final thing to get the degree. It's about building a set of skills and a showcase that students will take with them after they graduate. This can remain with the students for as long as they're in the workforce. They And during this course, as they are building this e-portfolio, they recognize the importance of building their e-portfolio as, as a complement to their resumes. And then finally, we also want students to co-construct knowledge. It's one thing to build an e-portfolio in a vacuum, but as we know, nothing really happens in a vacuum. So instead, we bring in a peer evaluation component so that students review one another's e-portfolios and identify the strengths and think of ways to improve it. And so as they do this, students have the chance to reflect on not only their own skills and growth, but also on their peer skills and growth. So it's like that old saying, a rising tide lifts all boats. That is exactly what we hope to do with the e-portfolio here. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it over to Morgan Myers, who is going to explain a little bit more about the ePortfolios in our BAOL program, including how we have structured them and how we provide support. Morgan, over to you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, let me share first why this assignment has been so useful to us in our program and why we selected it. So as Matthew shared, students are preparing for graduation by the time that they get to this capstone course. Um, with their new degree, they may be applying for a new job or they may be climbing the leadership pipeline in their current organization because we do have a lot of um, non-traditional students who are already working. So we want to provide them with something tangible that they can use to advance their opportunities when they leave the program. So the ePortfolio is just a perfect product for the students to take the core ideas from this program and um, that they've learned and showcase their mastery of those concepts for potential employers or potential advancement opportunities. And um, this is also something that they can update as they move throughout their careers. It's not a one and done, leave it type of assignment. Um, it's something that they can use for years to come. So um, next, I'll discuss outcome alignment across our program outcomes, course outcomes, and the portfolio assignment. All of the course outcomes that are related to the product are listed here, and I'll just touch on how a few of them align to what the students end up creating in the ePortfolio. Um, program outcomes for our organizational leadership program include things like applying an interdisciplinary approach to problem solving, which then gets translated to the leadership challenge section of the ePortfolio. Um, another one is integrating the use of quality performance tools, which is aligned to various sections that they develop on organizational team and individual performance in their ePortfolio. Another one is generally communicating ideas and concepts from their leadership perspective, which they do throughout this ePortfolio. So the goal of the ePortfolio is essentially to allow students a really creative way to express the knowledge that they've acquired over the course of the program. So with that, let's get into the design of the course and our design of the ePortfolio itself. All right, so the way that our capstone course is designed is that students come into the course with various materials, including a paper that's already written on topics such as individual team and organizational performance from this other course um, that they've taken typically the semester before that is tethered to this course. Um, so each week, what students do is take a piece of their paper to create a piece of their ePortfolio. And those pieces are listed here. 
they take the concepts from their paper, expand upon them, and also incorporate personal experience as well, because we don't want this e-portfolio to end up looking like it's just a paper that's been put online. And we want that paper to be transformed. So students also create a video that describes themselves and their career aspirations. And um, additionally, like Matthew said, they also post those individual pieces in discussion boards to receive feedback for revision and improvement from their peers and their instructors so that they're gradually improving this product until it's finished. And um, this is a screenshot from the course. It's the first part of the ePortfolio assignment um, where students just set up their pages. And as you can see, we have instructions and then we also have an example and we, tr we try to provide many robust supports in the course that um, I will talk about next. All right, so something that we've learned over the course of um, offering this course is that the electronic portfolio can be a difficult project for students to um, grasp if they haven't created this type of project before. So we layer in a lot of support for students to guide them through their creation. So besides those structured feedback opportunities, um, students are also provided with tutor tutorials for navigating Google Sites, um, which is our recommended platform for the creation, although we tell students they can use whatever tool they'd like. Um, this is just the one that we provide the most support for. Um, tips for everything from how to lay out their page, how to select their images, how to create a high quality video. Um, we include tabs with examples from former students that they they, um, can use to sort of envision what their product might end up looking like. And we continue to update the course as we see what students require to be successful and um, to create a great product. Our most recent addition is what you'll see on the very bottom there, a wisdom wall, which is an aspect of humanizing online education um, that we hope allows students to benefit from the advice that former students post upon exiting the course. Um, so it's been a very iterative design and we hope to continue improving the course to assist students so that they can create something they're really proud of when they're leaving. Okay, so to conclude the discussion on the ePortfolio, I just wanted to very quickly share a few of the tangible skills that we want students to have by the time they leave our program. Um, things like managing and improving the performance of individuals, teams, organizations, um, relying on evidence to drive their decision making, solving challenges that leaders typically face, and um, communicating their ideas through a digital project, um, just to name a few. So uh, let's wrap this up. My question for you all, and if you'll just put this in the chat, that would be great. Um, with this in mind, uh, that we've discussed simulations, micro-credentials, and e-portfolios as our examples, um, what is one way that you might integrate an applied assignment in your course that could help your students uh, prepare as they um, enter a career in your field? Um, so you can please post whatever you're considering in the chat, and I know that we're running short on time, so I want to go ahead and open up the floor to all of you as well if you would like to unmute you can or if you want to post in the chat um, what questions do you have for us that we might be able to answer for you okay andrea is loving the e-portfolio idea we love it too it's one of my favorite um, course assignments and Michelle actually teaches the course and um, she has said that it is the most um, just transformative learning experience that um, she's encountered in a course. It is one of the most uh, beneficial uh, courses that I have ever taught and students absolutely love the experience. They're so used to writing a culminating paper and here they get to create a product to showcase themselves and it is, it is a fantastic experience. Okay, and Ali said that um, she is sending the link to people who are teaching right now so that they can get ideas from it. That's awesome. Um, why did we choose Google, uh, Google Sites instead of Microsoft Office? Um, I was not part of the initial development of the course, um, so I'm not sure what the impetus for choosing Google Sites was, but um, we've had a lot of success with it. Um, Matthew, do you have any background info on that? Um, I actually uh, do not. Um, 
but the instructor who did teach this before had quite a bit of familiarity with Google Sites. So I imagine that was probably part of it, just like something that the instructor could say, hey, I know this. And so this is what I'm going to build off. But Google Sites does have a very rich and robust like, WYSIWYG editor um, that students can basically use to drag and drop uh, sections and modify a text size and um, video and uh, visual content on the fly. Um, and Google does have a very robust set of help documents um, for whatever aspect of building a site that they would need. Um, so really, we just wanted to stick with simplicity here. Like, honestly, like when we were evaluating this, like we thought, okay, Google Sites is, if we provide it, the appropriate scaffolding, can be an effective resource for students to use. Yeah, and our experience has also been that um, a lot of our students maintain their access to um, anything they develop in Google after graduating whenever they leave our college um, and they don't necessarily keep access to some of our Microsoft Office products. So that might have been a yeah, reason ease, as well. Yeah, the ease of sharing those products and maintaining those after they leave the university was part of the impetus for it and also just the user-friendly nature of it. So um, I know you all have to go. You probably have another session. We'll stay on for another minute or two in case you have any questions. We'd love to chat with you, give you uh, email links for further conversations. But just thank you so much um, for attending today and enjoy the rest of your Friday. Yeah, and I believe our emails are on that next slide if you want to um, go to that, Matthew, so that everybody can reach out to us. Um, yeah, Kara was highly involved in the um, the first examples that we shared. And then I believe Matthew, Michelle, and I have um, have been involved with the ePortfolio. So if that helps you direct your questions, great. All right, any other questions we can answer for anyone who hung on for a second today? Looks like we are good to go. So thank you. And thanks for the opportunity, Brad. We appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone.